Hello and welcome back to The Wine School and in part three of our look at Spain we're focusing on Catalonia or Catalonia, uh, the region to the west of Barcelona uh, in coastal and inland Spain. You may have heard of the Catalan separatist movement and that's really indicative of, this, of the countryside here and the people. It's markedly different from the rest of Spain. Uh, it's got much more in common with Catalan France, that sort of Languedoc area. Um, there's a huge range of areas to choose from, from areas along the Mediterranean coast itself, quite warm, quite moderate, quite often at high altitudes because they've got mountains running down a lot of the coast as well, right through to scrubby high altitude inland vineyards with a more markedly continental climate, um, still slightly influenced by the Mediterranean, uh, but the, again this huge range of different vineyard areas and styles within Catalonia that we'll look at. To the north of the area we have the Pyrenees which is that great dividing range between Spain and France and some of the foothills here are producing some really interesting wines as well. Um, a lot of the production here is Cava. I don't want to dwell too much on this because we'll look at Cava in, in a separate episode along with sparkling wine, uh, but it's worth focusing on the grapes in Cava which are Jarello, Maccabea and Paris. For the reds, it's mainly Monastrel, which is Mavedra, Carignana, which is Carignan, also some Grenache and Tempranillo is permitted as well. Um, and as well as these, there's a whole host of sort of imported varieties from France mainly uh, that we can look at also, which are quite important in this area, more so than many others in Spain. The DO uh, for the whole region is Catalunya, but this is a relatively recent invention to allow more sort of blending between sub-regions. Um, as, as production sort of ramped up from the 70s onwards, we were finding that having the individual DOs that we'll look at weren't quite enough. Sometimes you wanted to have a sort of regional DO to cover some of these more modern wines with different varieties that were imported. Uh, one of the main names in this area that really put it on the map is Miguel Torres uh, from the 70s onwards, who really helped put the area on the map um, and take the focus away from sparkling wine to a certain extent, Carver in particular. Um, and he introduced quite a lot of aromatic varieties. If you think of the Torres Esmeralda, which is sort of in every supermarket, it's a, a really grapey blend of Muscat um, and Riesling, I think. Torres's influence has gone across Spain. Um, he's, he's got little parcels all over the place. Even in California, his daughter, Marimar Torres, has a very well-regarded estate in California. Um, the downside of this is, is Penedes and Catalonia as a whole is rather lacks identity, not just because it's seems more of a sparkling area, but also Torres is, has actually more of a brand identity than the region itself. So it's ironic that although he helped put the area on the map, it's, it's inextricable from his name and his identity as a winemaker. The first wine we're going to try today though from Penedes is the Loxarel from Cora, which is a Jarello and Muscat blend. And Jarello, as one of the grapes and Carver production, it's quite high in acidity can be a little strongly flavoured. I often think of it as like Chardonnay, it's a bit of a chameleon, it can come out in a variety of different styles. Here, I think the Jarello is providing backbone and acidity and the Muscat is giving its typical grapey, lovely floral element to the wine as well. Getting that lovely crisp acidity, a little bit of body, not too much, and it's really lovely wine, decent length as well. Nice and fresh, you could drink this on its own, it's a lovely aperitif wine, but actually it could send up some quite strong flavours like salted anchovies, garlicky mayonnaise. Um, so it's a very, very versatile wine, I think, and a really good example of some of the best whites that are coming out of this area. Next to Pinedes, as we go further down the coast, we have Tarragona, which is another of these areas that focuses mainly on Carver. Uh, there is a local speciality in aged fortified reds, very similar to the Maori and Banyuls that you'll find just over the Pyrenees in Languedoc. And I don't think it's a coincidence that wines of a similar style are being made here. There's a lot of crossover between the two, the two areas, uh, between France and Spain, particularly here. Again, being so dominated by Carver, the region doesn't really have a strong identity and a lot of the production here sort of stays within Spain as, and is consumed domestically. Um, to the north, as we head to the Pyrenees, uh, there's Lida, which is an area that's not really, really on our radar in the UK. Uh, but within this, there is the Costes del Segre, which is a more recently created DO. Um, and this, ironically, was created um, at the behest of one of the carver giants, Codonu Reimart, um, but more for still wines. And it's interesting that we're starting to see more of an identity of these French varieties that are coming into this area. One thing I want to say about this import of French varieties to this region is 
unlike a lot of Eastern Europe, I'm thinking particularly of Bulgaria, where a lot of these French varieties were brought in to make sort of commercially acceptable supermarket wines, Cabernet Sauvignon, Chardonnay, and they supplanted local indigenous, historically interesting wines. I think that was a shame, whereas here, I think, because there's such close ties between Spain and France, I'm thinking particularly what we saw previously with the connection between Rioja and Bordeaux, and that cross-border, you know, cross-border pollination between the two, where they helped each other out. Um, and with, with the grape varieties being imported into northern Spain from France, I think it's much more natural given this, particularly this area's regional identity being more Catalan than Spanish. Um, and in this area we have our next wine, which is from Costes del Segre, uh, right up in the Pyrenees, quite high altitude, right up near Andorra. Um, the vineyard areas here I think actually have more in common with Alpine northern Italy than they do what you think of as the Pyrenees being sort of very hot scrubland. It's actually quite, quite Alpine looking in this area. And here we have a Pinot Noir, not a grape you would naturally associate with this area at all. Even in France you wouldn't associate it with Languedoc, it's much further north than Burgundy. It's a very cool climate grape and it only succeeds here because of the high altitude. Uh, and this producer, one of their other wines, is Riesling, another grape that really only thrives in a cool climate area. So we'll give this a try. Now if you look at the colour, particularly come back to it when we go to the next one and look at the colour on this, it's very pale which is what you'd expect from Pinot Noir. It's got a typical Pinot Noir fragrance as well. There's a surprising amount of gaminess in this. Um, a little bit of, um, I'm going to use one of those awful sort of wine tasting terms, Brett or Brettanomyces, which some people see as a bit of a fault in wine. Uh, some winemakers actually like to have a little bit of it, particularly with Pinot Noir. It quite suits it. It's a slightly gamey smell. Some people, when it's a little bit too much, it smells like a lasterplast, sticking plaster. It's quite a fake smell. A little bit of it like this I think really suits the wine, but it can divide opinion. And again, I'm getting that sort of flavour in the mouth, a slight gaminess. You've got lovely pinot fruit there, raspberries. Again, that Breton and Mice is giving that slightly earthy flavour to it, which might make me think that it's slightly older than it is, but that's all from the Breton and Mice, that Brett, as we call it. Um, and it, it usually indicates a slightly more naturalistic approach to winemaking as well. This is a slightly more artisanally made wine, perhaps. Um, Really interesting and a good example of the sort of modern wines that are being made in this region. However, in this area, the biggest success story of recent years is Priorat. Um, the area's historic wine production area, um, after Phylloxera hits, it largely went unnoticed, like a lot of these areas, Rioja, all of them went through a bit of an abatement of interest. Um, it was originally planted by Carthusian monks. Uh, Priorat just means priory, um, they, and they came over from Provence. Again, that sort of cross-pollination between Spain and France um, is not just in recent years, it dates back centuries. And it was they, we think, who brought Grenache over with them, Spain's Garnacha, um, which was planted throughout Priorat. Um, after Phylloxera, a lot of the vineyards were replaced with Carignan, Carignana, uh, which is a bit of a workhorse grape. But as the vines get old, a lot of them in this area are still about a century old even after replanting, um, and these old Carignan vines and old Grenache vines produce some really good fruit. One of the things that makes this wine so unique, if you think of Rioja or Ribera del Duero, they have that lovely warmth of fruit. Uh, I think they're of those quite cosy wines, they're quite warming. There's a real freshness to these wines here, which is markedly different from most of the rest of Spain, if you think of those big, oaky, warming reds. Um, there's a really noticeable backbone of acidity in them, which is quite different from Rioja in particular, which is what most people think of when they first think of Spanish wine. Uh, one of the key elements that makes that is the soil, which is licorella, um, and this is a type of schist, um, a micace micaceous schist, try saying that for a few glasses, um, and this has a property that is very similar to limestone, which we mentioned before, which is a great soil type for most grape varieties, in that it allows rain to drain through quite freely, but it also retains moisture. So, um, and the rainfall here, as in most of Spain, is quite low, um, so it really helps the grape vines survive and thrive throughout the low rainfall and periods of drought and still produce good quality fruit. Um, for the reasons I've mentioned before, old vines tend to be more able to adapt and, and thrive in these drier soils once, the, once they're established. Most of the vineyards in Priora are on the mid slopes, uh, similar to Burgundy, but on a much more vertiginous um, aspect. 
Um, the, the lower soils, you get all the wash down, they tend to be more fertile if you think most agriculture takes place down in valley floors. On uh, Fertility is not great for grapevines, they actually like a little bit of stress. Um, too high up and it's too windy, if you think of that low rainfall, um, if there's too much wind, the transpiration from the grape leaves means that the grapes dry out, um, so they don't thrive there. So it's these mid-slopes where most of the best vineyards are, many of them in lovely sort of amphitheatres. Um, Janice Robinson actually visited the area 10-15 years ago and she commented that many of the vineyard workers uh, should really have ropes and crampons because some of these sites are set on 60 degree slopes which is a lot steeper than I'd be happy climbing up but the fruit they produce is fantastic. Um, most of the grapevines here are bush vine trained um, and this bottle actually handily gives you a picture of what the grapevines look like on the front. These old gnarled vines that produce very little but fantastic quality fruit. Although he wasn't the first to discover the area, uh, it was Alvaro Palacios, um, originally from Rioja, who really put this area on the map. He did a, work, a bit of work in Bordeaux, uh, particularly in Chateau Petrus, and um, he brought a lot of that knowledge back to this area just as it was being rediscovered. He was one of a group of five producers, um, all of whom established vineyards here in the 70s, and they're all called Clo something. His was called Clo Dofi. Uh, it's now been renamed Finca Dofi. Clo I think for me really emphasises more of a sort of French connection if you think of the all those Clos Bougeot and things like that in Burgundy. Uh, it's now Finca Dofi, which is a much more Spanish name, uh, Finca being farm or estate. Um, then in the early 90s he purchased uh, a group of vineyards around Gratelops, which is right in the centre of Priorat, um, and he created La Mita vineyard, uh, which is now one of Spain's most expensive and sought after reds. Um, it's got a world-class reputation, you know, head and shoulders above any, almost anything else in Spain. So La Mita is now one of Spain's top red wines, um, pretty much head and shoulders above almost anything else in Spain, um, very sought after. Um, but his influence sort of across this area and beyond, we'll see this name, I mentioned Palacios particularly because we'll see him again when we come to look at northwest Spain next time. Uh, La Mita aside, we're at the stage where a lot of these wines are actually not that expensive. Uh, and the next one we've got is the Ardiles from Priorat, which is much more modestly priced, uh, but still a really good example of a wine from this area. Um, also on the label, they very handily put a picture of these old vines that they've got there. They tend to be quite gnarled. Most of them are bush vines. They're trained quite low to the ground to protect them from uh, too much wind or too many of the elements. Um, also because they're so old, they're, they're, they're quite, they produce very little fruit. Good quality, but very little. So the yields in this area are quite small. Again, it's got a real lightness. It's nothing like anything else from Spain. Again, it's got a real freshness to it, really vibrant acidity. Lovely fruit, none of it baked. It's not stewed fruit, it's very light. It's got a muscularity and depth, but it's, it's sort of worn quite lightly. It's a really versatile wine. You could have this with venison, game, quite strong meats. Um, you could have it with lamb, but it needs to be something like quite, quite rich stew with black olives and tomatoes, lots of those. Dare I say Provencal type flavours in there. Um, really good wine for the money. Length is really good, I'm still tasting it now. It's got a huge amount going on there. There's a little bit of leather on the finish. It's developing, it's gaining some age and those tertiary characteristics. You could keep it for a lot longer if you wanted to get more of those sort of gamey aromas. Um, yeah, just a fantastic wine for the money, I think. Really, really good quality. Around Priorat and also helping shelter it is Monsanto. Uh, which has some of the same soils. It's not quite as high an altitude. It produces wines that are in the same mould as Priorite, but they very rarely reach the same heights. But again, they're still very good quality for what they are and still worth looking out for. We'll come back to this region in a little more detail when we come to look at sparkling wines. Um, and I think throughout it, you might think I've rather maligned Carver. I haven't. I think it's just a shame that it overshadows so many of the great wines that are available in this area. Uh, with Priorite, it is starting to gain a bit more of a regional identity. We're starting to see wines from this area gaining a bit more stature in the UK market, um, a more cohesive identity I suppose is what I'm saying. There's so many gems out there because so many of these regions in Spain are fluid at the moment, old vineyards being rediscovered and there's this really great crossover in the last 30 or 40 years between these old areas being rediscovered and their old vines along with sort of innovation and vision that are producing some really interesting and some spectacular wines. And I look forward to seeing you next week when we move across to northwest Spain. We'll see you there. Thank you.